Thank you very much once again. Uh, so I was asked to talk on vascular access care individual or team approach, and I didn't know how to approach this topic, so I, I just thought I would bring in uh, some cases and discuss how as a team, I think the common theme of this meeting has been since all morning that we have to approach vascular access related problems as a team. No one single individual can perform uh, or provide the best possible care. Uh, I do not have anything to disclose. Uh, and, and as I included the slide yesterday in my talk, uh, it, it has to be a team uh, effort. Uh, the team includes not just the nephrologist and the surgeon, includes primary care physicians. Uh, that's the person who can help identify uh, renal failure patients early and, and have early referral for uh, preventive care as well as if they progress for access planning the interventionalist or the radiologist, the dialysis staff, and the patient himself or herself. Uh, all of these uh, are key components of a team, and, and my cases will highlight how we can empower our patients and how each team member can play a role in, in uh, maintaining the patency of an access or at least identifying an, a dysfunctional access early enough so that one can intervene and probably try to help the patient continue with the same access. So my first case is a 45-year-old male. He's a bank executive. His end-stage renal disease was secondary to polycystic kidney disease. He was on home hemodialysis five days a week, taking uh, dialysis for the past three years. He self-cannulates his uh, radiocephalic fistula. Uh, he, uh, and, and on that particular day, he successfully placed his arterial needle, but was unable to place the venous needle. And, and that raised an alarm. And because he was well-educated uh, about the uh, monitoring of his access and the importance of keeping the access patent, uh, he definitely saw this as a red flag and called up his uh, dialysis unit with this problem. He calls up his dialysis unit, he discusses it with his charge nurse, and the charge nurse asks him to come straight away to the dialysis unit for further evaluation. Uh, the patient is evaluated now by an expert who confirms that the axis uh, really is very pulsatile, it's bounding at the juxta and astromatic segment, and there was no thrill. There was an acute drop in pulse, so beyond uh, the juxta and astromatic region, in the mid forearm, there was no flow in the outflow segment. So the patient was immediately referred and uh, had an angiogram done. Uh, and as you can see here, okay. the cannula was placed, contrast was injected, and there was no forward flow, but the contrast refluxed into the radial artery. So there was an acute thrombosis which was easily identified because the patient was aware of the, of the problem that he has to examine the fistula and make sure that the fistula has a pulse and a thrill. And because of early identification, even though it seems as if there's an acute obstruction with no contrast flowing, the guide wire was easy to pass across this obstruction through the soft thrombus, and the thrombus was extracted with a simple uh, a thrombectomy procedure, and a forward flow was established. The access, was, uh, re the access flow was reestablished. Uh, so clearly, educating our patients to examine the access on a daily basis really helps in identifying a dysfunctional access in, in, in a timely manner. Uh, how about the dialysis nurses how, or the dialysis technicians? So this is an example where a 35-year-old African-American male with end-stage renal disease uh, he had end-stage renal disease from a presumed focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. He had a transposed forearm basilic vein uh, AV fistula. The patient reports uh, weak pulse and thrill near the anastomosis. The dialysis staff confirms it. So there was, again, poor inflow augmentation, a very high-pitched bruit at the anastomosis, and, and, and that raised a red flag that, required, that, that suggested there needs to be uh, definite further intervention right away. The patient was referred on the same day for intervention. So this is what the patient had, the basilic vein, 
uh, was, was transposed from the posterior aspect of the forearm to the volar aspect of the forearm and, and the transposed basilic vein was, uh, transposed basilic uh, to radial artery, uh, AV fistula was created. Because of significant uh, surgical handlings, because of swing side, a long swing side, this patient clearly had uh, juxta and astromatic stenosis in the swing side segment, which was clinically identified with uh, a poor augmentation, poor thrill at the anastomosis. So again, physical examination, monitoring, making the patient aware, and, and the dialysis staff, nurses, and technicians, they are the first line of approach. It's not the physicians who, who, can, uh, who come into the picture. By the time the physician comes into the picture, it's generally pretty late. So empowering our patients is the message here. Again, this is a team approach. Case number three is a 55-year-old truck driver. He's uh, diabetic, hypertensive, obese, uh, CKD5, not yet on dialysis, had a small uh, an atherosclerotic radial artery, but he had a good cephalic vein, so his cephalic vein was transposed into a loop forma formation and connected to the brachial artery. The transposed loop uh, AV fistula in the forearm matures well within eight to 10 weeks. He was undergoing his uh, uh, pre-transplant workup and as part of pre-transplant workup, he had to undergo a left heart catheterization. He, he was exposed to a large volume of contrast. Unfortunately, that led to uh, rapid progression to where he needed to start dialysis. A few months into the dialysis, uh, his physical examination findings changed. The, the inflow augmentation was really very poor. The nurses were unable to uh, achieve the prescribed blood flow. So the, in, in, U, in, in US and in North America, generally we use a blood flow of at least 350 to 400. And, and over a period of time, the prescribed blood flow was not uh, achievable during his dialysis treatment. There were frequent arterial alarms. And his monthly lab work showed poor solute clearance. His KT, KT over V was barely 1.1 on, on a consistent basis. So this clearly warranted further in evaluation. So this was a forearm cephalic vein that was looped and an astomose to the brachial artery, creating a forearm looped AV fistula. Now when he first presented with, uh, uh, with, with uh, poor augmentation and inability to achieve uh, the prescribed blood flow, uh, a fistulogram was done that clearly showed, so let me orient everybody. Uh, so this is the venous end of the, f so that's the cephalic vein that has been uh, mobilized and looped up to be an astromose to the brachial artery. So the blood flow is from the brachial artery across the loop back to the heart. So the wire is now placed retrograde towards the anastomosis and when the contrast was injected, you can see that in the juxtaanastomotic region, there is a really long stenotic segment which clinically was easily identified as poor augmentation and other clinical signs where it, it failed to provide adequate blood flow during dialysis. This segment was initially angioplastied successfully which, which helped with uh, maintaining the same access for few more months but patient continued to require frequent angioplasty of this segment that warranted uh, a, a planning for a next fistula. Now, whenever you require angioplasty or intervention frequently more than a couple of times every three to six months, that, that, would, that, that would indicate that a fistula probably will not last too long and one has to start planning for a second axis. Uh, and, and at any given time frame, uh, the, the, the advantage by make, making plans for the subsequent access is to, one, if possible, completely avoid use of a tunnel catheter. And, and if that's not an option, at least with the plan in place, you can minimize the exposure to a catheter to preserve the central veins. That, uh, and, and, and with that in plan, when we discuss this with our surgical team, the the uh, studies showed that this segment certainly was not going to last too long 
and the proximal vessels were evaluated. And when the proximal vessels were evaluated, the basilic vein and the cephalic vein in the upper arm clearly were very well developed and matured. So the plan was to, so that's the forearm loop cephalic vein uh, fistula with a, with, a, with a nicely developed upper arm cephalic vein. And, and as, a, as a team consensus, what was decided was to anastomose or to convert this upper arm cephalic vein into a brachiocephalic fistula. A side-to-side -side anastomosis was created, which, which helped the flow to be directed from the brachial artery into the loop as well as from the brachial artery into the proximal cephalic vein. By doing this, uh, we were able to avoid a catheter placement. Once the surgical site healed up, we were able to switch the cannulation to the upper arm using the brachiocephalic AV fistula. So again, these uh, decisions were possible only because of teamwork, only because of the involvement of the surgeons, the nephrologists, the dialysis nurses, and the patient who really pointed out the problems early enough for the entire events to be planned. So essentially, every axis or in every, every uh, AV axis eventually will fail, and, and one should always be uh, prepared to plan for the next axis. And as a team, if the difficult axes are always uh, discussed as a team, then the plan can be placed and recorded in the chart so nobody comes up with or nobody has to face in, 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 a, in a short time frame to, to plan for the subsequent axis. Uh, here, in this case, clearly uh, the, the events were well recorded. Everybody on the team were well informed, and the plan was made, and, and the plan was executed. So prolonged access patency was possible. Uh, timely conversion of a failing access to a definitive secondary AV fistula was possible. And again, uh, highlighting that a team approach helps prevent a catheter exposure uh, completely. Now... I, I think it's, it's good to have stories, and, and, and I had a story yesterday, and I thought I can include a story today uh, which will highlight uh, the, the importance of uh, empowering patients and, 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 and educating our patients, and I, I think the onus is on us as dialysis providers to educate our patients. So this was a, a very interesting story where a 65-year-old lady who had a right transposed AV fistula. She had a granddaughter who used to sleep in her lap every afternoon, and she would place her head on the uh, axis arm and would listen to the whooshing sound of the AV fistula. Now, one afternoon, she noticed that the train had stopped, and she tells her grandma that, hey, the train's not running anymore. Uh, that's how she described the AV fistula, and she liked listening to the train sound. The, the, the patient obviously was alerted. She calls in the dialysis staff. The dialysis staff uh, calls her back to the dialysis unit for further evaluation. And lo and behold, I mean, we all know that transpose basilic fistula has a swing site where the vein moves from, this, from the deeper segment, uh, deeper tissues to the superficial tunnel. And that's, that's the site where she had a tight stenosis. And, and what the nurses had missed was she had history of prolonged bleeding during dialysis and the access when she was re-examined when she came to the uh, to, to the dialysis unit the access had a real bounding pulse with absence of thrill so clearly there were physical signs that suggested there was stenosis and and it was diagnosed by or it was brought to the attention because of a, a small child and and the kicker here is the granddaughter was three years old. So if a three-year-old can identify a dysfunctional axis, I think uh, all our technicians, all our dialysis nurses, and our patients definitely can identify. Literacy is definitely not a factor here. So the take-home message is empower your patients. Teamwork is important. Patients can learn to monitor their access. They can do simple physical examinations every day. Uh, dialysis staff 
needs to be proficient and they need to be meticulous with access examination every time a patient comes in for dialysis before they stick the needles the access needs to be examined and timely referral and teamwork can help prolong patency can minimize catheter duration may not always be a possible to avoid a catheter but it definitely will minimize catheter duration and ongoing monitoring and team planning can improve overall access care thank you very much Thank you, Professor Pachitani. It's over to the chairpersons for discussion for three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tushar, for a beautiful presentation. We all agree that it is a uh, teamwork, including uh, a nephrologist. Uh, if there is any comment or question from, uh, from chairpersons or from the audience. Okay. Congratulations, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, so one uh, question and one comment. You know, the, the comment first, I think it's absolutely, uh, you know, it's, it's imperative that there is teamwork and there is recognition and, and, as you say, empowerment of the patients as well as the families themselves to learn to, you know, look for the train sound, whooshing sound or whatever. And in fact, you can even give them a stethoscope and tell them how to sort of hear it every day. So, you know, things like that can be done. As far as the question, you know, you talked about the side-to-side -side fistula that you created with the cephalic loom, uh, loop arm in there. Now, from our knowledge of vascular surgery, whenever you do a side arm which has two outflows, one never, I mean, one of them will die. I mean, there is no way, and it would die sooner than later. It's not that, you know, it would give you enough time for this to work while uh, this one is healing. So how did you uh, sort of face Yes, that? so those, those were exactly the thoughts. And, and here the surgeon was willing to take a gamble. I mean, there were two, actually, two, two concerns. One, we would increase the uh, blood flow through the axis by, by, by a and, and adding further to the cardiac output, which could potentially put an extra load on the heart. So that was one concern. And two, it could potentially also cause some venous hypertension. And, and the, the, the uh, ob objective behind doing this was if it worked, we would, we would avoid a catheter uh, placement. If, if there were any complications that were noticed within the first few weeks, after the surgery was done, then the surgeon was planning to go in and ligate off the forearm loop fistula and just leave the brachiocephalic as, as the primary fistula. I don't know whether this question has been asked, but uh, we generally find that if you have a failed radial fistula or a brachial fistula, you do ipsilateral the opposite, I mean the brachial for the radial and the radial for the, for the uh, brachial, you find that you can use the fistula faster. Any, any, the, because the veins have already developed, uh, any any guidelines or any any inputs on that? Yes, so that's that's the que that's uh, the secondary fistula creation. So if you have a failed radiocephalic fistula and if your proximal cephalic vein is wide open, you can convert those to a to an ipsilateral brachiocephalic uh, fistula. And, and yes, that that should be that should be the practice, and and that can be done only if you have been monitoring the fistula and if your team is involved in in in, in documenting those uh, decisions as to if one side fails rather than going to the opposite side, look for uh, the proximal side which might be easier to perf convert it into a navy fistula and have a shorter maturation time. Good morning, sir. Sir, um, is there any cutoff time uh, wherein you judge that uh, I can salvage this fistula like uh, the patient presence within this set of time after uh, the loss of thrill, uh, I'm going to try salvaging or uh, you just go by the uh, physical signs and the ultrasound like if, if it's uh, pretty much viable the th acute thrombus on the ultrasound examination. So is there any cutoff time? You say after this point I'm not going to try even uh, salvage the fission. Generally in my experience uh, about three to four days is when uh, you, you can really have a reasonable success rate with a salvage procedure. Beyond three to four days, the clot starts organizing and, and endovascularly, I, I have not had any, any success uh, re-establishing the flow. Okay. And, and I'm sure uh, there are surgeons up here who may have a different, uh, different experience that they may want to share. So uh, do you yeah. go for only a mechanical uh, thrombectomy or a pharmacomechanical thrombectomy? Uh, both. Both. both yeah. I, I'm sorry for the interruption, Mr. Chairman. We have totally run out of time for the presentation. We move on to the next paper.
Thank you, Professor Vajrajani, with the permission of the chair.